Rod Camerata, it's great to see you. Welcome to the Seekers Forum. It's great to be here. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Rob. I wanted to talk to you about, because we're looking this month at fear and courage and the insight that comes from facing our fears. So I don't know anyone who has been more courageous than you for the last few years taking care of our late dear friend, Robin. And I wanted to talk to you about three kinds of courage that I think you've faced in your life. And then we can just approach it however the conversation flows. You know, first, as an artist, uh, the fears that an artist goes through creating work and then putting it into the world. Uh, second, as a gay woman uh, and facing the things that come along uh, in that lifestyle and what you have experienced in your life. And finally, the experience of nursing someone that you love through a terrible illness and how you confront the fears of that with them. Because I have to say, Rob, one of the things that impressed me so much watching you with Robin was how open you were with her about her condition, what was coming, uh, and what you were facing together. So let's start. I want to start by asking you about your childhood and how your childhood prepared you for the kinds of things you would be facing in your life. Did you go through a lot of fear and challenge as a kid? Not really. I, I mean, yes and no. I didn't go through the kinds that I think most kids go through, like awkward middle school years or something like that. I had, a, for various different reasons, a lot of fear around who was going to take care of me, financial insecurity, stuff of that nature. My parents created a sort of chaotic household, to put it a little bit mildly, and I was on my own a lot. I had a lot of uh, free reign where I probably shouldn't have, but that gave me confidence. And it also let me learn to explore, to question things, to consider possibilities, you know, to have an open mind in that way. And to, to actually, I, I believe I learned in, you know, fear, I, I think fear gets a really bad rap. And, um, there certainly is fear that um, the opposite of courage, something that keeps you from being courageous. But there's fear that is healthy fear, you know, um, of danger and that kind of thing. And I learned about that fear and learning about that kind of very real fear in the world, healthy fears, taught me in a way not to fear the things that I think kids with, you know, healthy families and you know happy childhoods learned to fear silly things i don't really fear those things at all i just sort of learned to approach life as as a situation where anything is possible and i can listen carefully to myself and determine my fate mm -hmm. so, and so as a, as a gay person as a gay person, was it challenging for you? Were there fears about coming out? Did you confront fears as, as a woman and as a gay woman? Um, you know, growing up in a female body, you always have a certain built-in set of fear if you're conscious, I think. And, you know, that's just around safety. Um, but I didn't have any fear at all in terms of coming out. I, I just looked at it as my truth and I didn't um, scream and yell about it except, you know, at protests. I was very, very active politically as a young person, mm -hmm. but I, and, you know, in my family, it was just a fact that I stated, I brought girlfriends home to meet, you know, my mom always. And, you know, she had the same look of terror always, but, um, I, I wasn't scared of that. She might have been, but I wasn't. And I, I really firmly believe that nine times out of 10, people treat you the way you treat them combined with the way you demand to be treated. And so I didn't really have a lot of fear around being queer. I think that I had a lot of dysmorphia. I had a lot of... <laughs> questions around gender that were not being addressed culturally when I was young. 
to the degree that they are now. So now I can choose non-binary on my California license and it's awesome. You know, I love that. Um, but then I felt very clearly like I, I had to be gay because I was a female body person attracted to female body people. But I did, it didn't gel, you know, it didn't really fit. Lesbianism fit as a political theory, but not as a gender identity for me. So that I, I feel like was, you know, there was certainly fear around that. Fear mainly of being alone, although I'm pretty good at being alone, but, you know, fear of not ultimately having a home, which is a much, much bigger theme. That's where... That's where, you know, Robin and I um, built a world of questions around home and a world of answers. Mm. And it certainly has played a huge, huge role in my painting. What's the difference between identifying as a lesbian versus identifying as a non-binary person, a lesbianism as a political thing versus uh, lesbianism as a, a sense of self and how you relate in relationships? I think that for me, being a young queer person in a female body, there was no way to not be political. Your body was political. You know, there was just no way around it. And so I had a really active role in, you know, of various different organizations that are not existent now, like the committee, well, anyway, the committee in solidarity with the people of El Salvador, or now, you know, those were, when I was 18, the chapter of now at my college was headed up by like an 80 year old woman who retired, didn't want to do it anymore. And so I did it and I was young, you know, I was really young. It was Mondale Ferraro years. And, um, same with CISPIS. I was really active in CISPIS and, you know, act, act up. And I was very, very active in those years because everybody I knew was dying of AIDS, you know, and it just opened my eyes in a much bigger way to what could happen to us as queers if we are not dealt with as humans first. And so for me, that's where the politic was, you know, in a female body, I was a feminist. There was no way around it. And I think that sleeping with women and being a very active feminist, it made sense to call myself a lesbian. But I, it just didn't seem right. My, I was not in the right space mentally for that. I was politically, but not mentally. And so being able to sort of be recognized as non-binary in the world, the greater world, on legal documents and such, is great because it acknowledges that I really straddle that line very clearly. Like there is not a side I fall on. I don't, you know, have any grand desire to be recognized as a born male man, you know, walking down the street, nor do I have any desire to be, you know, um, feminized walking down the street or, you know, to fall into a, I, I love the category of women. I just don't feel like I belong there. So <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where I just am in the middle and there was never a name for that for so long. You know, there wasn't anything that I could call myself that made sense. And there still to some degree isn't non-binary sounds like something you're looking at in a microscope. Oh my God, it's non-binary. You know, it doesn't sound like you're describing a human being. It sounds like you're describing an amoeba or something. Mm. So that's my answer, Mark. Do you, do you ever have thoughts about transitioning, doing something like that, going through that process? Um, it depends on what you mean by transitioning, because usually when people say transitioning, they mean ending on the male binary, end of the binary. Right. So I'm in the process of changing my body to be the way I want it to be, but not with the goal of ending on the male binary, just with the goal of being comfortable in my body. So I think there's a continuum there that is kind of growing, you know? Yeah. Everything yeah. is possible now, which is really great all of a sudden. 
It is great. And I'm interested in the fears that go along with that. So just one more question around this. Are there fears around letting go of a, a female identity, having been born a woman? What um, are the fears that come along with gender fluidity? They must exist. I'll tell you. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. For me, it's very connected to the fear of not ever finding a home, of not ever knowing where I belong. And for me, and this may not be true for other people, but the whole gender quandary is a lot about knowing where I belong in a, in a specific way, whereas the home question is knowing where I belong in a much bigger way. And so I feel like they're very connected. And yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, I have a lot of fear around that. I try really hard to sit with the idea of there not being an easy answer. There not being a final thing that makes sense, you know, and just sort of trying to love the question instead of looking for the answer. So that's mm -hmm. how I approach it a lot. It doesn't always work. It does sometimes. Right. Um, I mean, I feel really good within that question, you know, within the not knowing. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. I think where I get stuck is if I step out of the moment and I look at it in a very broad way of maybe never knowing, or I start to anticipate the future of not belonging, that's when I, I have a problem. So as long as I'm in the moment, I'm okay with the not knowing. But I think fear comes with that reaching out from the moment. Projecting yes. into the future. Right, which is, you know, a lot why it's very connected to the way that my artistic endeavors ground me, because they're very much about a specific moment. You know, I write from a specific moment. I paint and create something that is alive right now that wasn't five seconds ago. So it's yeah. very grounding for me. Yeah, and I was just going to ask you about how this ties into being an artist and whether it grounds you, uh, the specific fears around creativity. Have you always been a visual artist since you were a kid? I have, since I was really, really young. I had, you know, I, I don't know, I was kind of a weirdo. I was a smart kid, but I was, I was not great at paying attention. And so the way that I grappled with school from the time I was about maybe seventh or eighth grade on, was I was allowed to draw all through classes instead of taking notes. Because if I drew, I was creating something that happened while the learning was going on in the classroom and I would remember it that way. Mm. So, you know, I have notebooks and notebooks full of these drawings that I would do in high school somewhere. I don't know where they are, but they're around. Um, as a way of remembering, you know, the things I needed to remember to be quizzed on later. So mm -hmm. I, I would, you know, from the time I was very, very young, I was painting and drawing all the time on everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, so how does that ground you? How, or how does that ground an artist being in the, that creative process, the process of, tra of transforming things? Sure. Like sitting in class and transforming a lecture, you know, transforming a class into visual cues. It's sort of the ultimate here and now. I mean, the way I see it is, you know, I, I love the artist Joseph Kosuth. Do you know him? Mm -mm. He's fantastic. He talked about how important it was to eliminate all artistic um, charms from, from art pieces, that you should take away all the visual and just provide the essential, which for him was words a lot. So when I was young, I was heavily into to him and I wrote a lot. But for me, I discovered that creating that visual that is not only words, but you know, colors and shapes was really critically important to me. And the way that it grounds me is you have to be very specifically in that pinpoint moment mm. to successfully step from this glob of paint to that glob of pain. You mm -hmm. cannot be in your head. You cannot be in tomorrow. You cannot be in yesterday. Mm -hmm. You've got to really be in that moment. 
And at least for me, that's how it coalesces, you know? And it's really, it's really about trust, I think. Trusting myself, trusting the artistic process, trusting myself as some kind of channel for whatever I'm going to create, which is not always, it often is, but is not always something that is already there in my head. Mm-hmm. And I also and so, combine a lot place. of, I combine a lot of different materials. Mm. So I might use wood, a lot of overlays of plastic, of tissue paper, of different things on paintings that create texture. So it's really a building process as much as a painting process. Mm, mm. So it sounds uh, like a spiritual process to me. Totally. In, in that it brings you into the present. It's about transformation. Yeah. Uh, it's about somehow connecting in a deeper level to something that is bigger than the self. Uh, yeah, and I think that's where the words in my paintings come in. So. I use a lot of visuals of words, but I also created this process that works for me in my paintings, which is about language. It's a lot about language. And for me, what that does is it sort of defines a moment using that language. It would look like scribble to someone else or um, maybe like a language they don't know. Mm. But it, it looks like writing often. Um, a lot of times when things were really overwhelming with Robin and I was terrified, um, that's, I, I found that when I was painting, I would rely much, much more on that language, that I would use it to just get every emotion I had out of my body so that when I interacted with her, I could be more calm, you know, more certain of what I was doing. That's so interesting. So let's say you're in a moment feeling a lot of anxiety or fear, discomfort. You go to a canvas and then describe to me what happens next. Well, I could show you. But yes, yeah. what, what happens next is I start usually with color. Now I'm just at my friend's desk. I don't even know where there's paper. Oh, oh I see. Oh, you're going to demonstrate. I thought you had something, a oh. piece there. I can bring one up on the screen. Would that be easier? That would be amazing. So I could do it on my phone or I could do it on the actual screen. I don't know what's easier for you. So one thing I did a lot of when Robin was sick is I did a lot of installations out in the world. Now, this would look like graffiti to someone. But it's not, it's this, I'm trying to look at where it's gonna be seen easiest, probably right here. So this yeah. is an example of the writing that I do on paintings, but it's out in the middle of nowhere on a road we call Tarantula Road, because we would always see tarantulas up there. Is that a photograph? Yeah. So I and would, I would create this, then I would photograph it in different seasons, I would overlay the photographs. I would create other paintings, which I'll show you out of the photographs. But that's the kind of writing that ended up on my paintings. Um, wait, let me just. So, so this is a good example. So in this painting, yeah, you can see the writing that looks like a language or okay okay something yeah 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 so oh yes got it so it's very it's strangely uniform and systematic but it's very automatic with me it's not like i'm telling myself to make this shape or that it's just what comes out it's a way of screaming through a pen, really, is what it is. Those aren't actual words. That's not actual writing, is it? No. Sometimes what I'm doing is, not always, but occasionally I'm thinking the words as I write, and they're spasmatically all over the place. And I have 
paintings that are just writing on a white background. And in those paintings, you can sometimes see a word or two. Right. Often not. And then I'll show you another one. So here's another one. And the writing you see kind of blurs into the painting. You see it on the bottom there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it uh, just it becomes part of the image of a painting. Right. And so it's the idea, it's the spirit of words without being words. It's yeah. the feeling of language without being actual language. Yes, that's exactly what it is. That's interesting. That's so interesting. Yeah. yeah. And it changes just like, you know, your feelings yeah. change, your language changes. Yeah. Well, we're going to, I'm going to uh, share a lot of your artwork with the community when, when, when the interview posts. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd like to talk now about Robin uh, and sure. the reason that we know one another and, mm -hmm. and, and what happened. Uh, can you tell me in, just give me an overview of sure. the experience. So, you know, Robin was a super, super athletic, healthy person. Always ate well, ran every day, et cetera. Had the body of 18 year old at 60. She completely was the healthiest person I knew. She all of a sudden started to have trouble walking and creating certain letters when she wrote. And they figured out pretty quickly that her cerebellum on one side, the back of her brain was shrinking. So we had a series of MRIs over six months that showed consistent shrinkage of that part of her brain. Initially, they thought it was an autoimmune response and an overreaction of your body to a virus or a bug bite. They pretty quickly figured out that it was a neurodegenerative disease. Um, over time, when she had a lot of autonomic features, which are changes to the way your body does functions without you making a decision, like breathing, swallowing, heart rate, all of that. As she started to have trouble with those things, they figured out that it was multiple system atrophy cerebellar, which is a neurodegenerative disease. And over the course of eight and a half, nine years that we knew she had symptoms, she probably had the disease much longer than that. But over the course of that time, she went from, you know, running every day to not being able to walk on her own, to using a rollator, then a wheelchair, to not being able to hold herself up, feed herself, lift a glass, write, read. That was a really big one. Um, writing and reading were the hardest. When she couldn't hold her phone or use a computer, it was very, very difficult. But we became, you know, I used to call us the two-headed monster, you know, because we could do everything together. We had a rule that we started when she had trouble walking and we were living in Utah a mile up this mountain and it was just so beautiful. Every day I would go and hike and I would try to bring her with me. And when I brought her, she was so scared because her footing was so uncertain. And we were on huge mountains. And I would hold on to her and we had a deal that, you know, we could do anything as long as we did it slowly and together. Mm -hmm. And so we would just go very slowly. And we sort of carried that through to the very, very end of her life. You know, when I was doing stuff like trying to get her into a sitting position or something, we would just do everything slowly. And, you know, pretty soon that happened. But that's, that's what happened. She became incapacitated and I, quit my job in order to be able to take care of her myself as opposed to having someone else do it. Um, I didn't want to miss one minute with her and I didn't want to leave her in the care of someone who might not know what they're doing or who might end up making a mistake that they then felt terrible and guilty about. I just didn't want to do that to someone. And so, let's talk about the fears that went along with leaving your career, uh, and devoting yourself there devoting yourself to caring for this person with a chronic and uh, incurable disease. How did you find the courage to do that? Well, it was not optional. She, 
she was my soulmate, is my soulmate. And she and I just had a deal that we were going to try to live large as long as possible. And that I would never leave her no matter what happened. I would never put her in a nursing home no matter what happened. That I would be with her when she died. And we, you know, a long time ago, I had a breast lump removed. And when that happened, the doctor said cancer to me, said the word cancer right out of the gate. I didn't have cancer luckily, but she said to me, this could easily be cancer. And I never forgot that because it took all my fear away all of my worry about what this is, what this is, go right to the worst case scenario. It's cancer, you know? And once I had considered that and started to think about what I would do if it was cancer, I wasn't scared anymore. And so I approached that same situation with Robin where we had a deadly disease. In this case, we knew that it would take her life eventually. And so what I did was I said to her, straight out of the game, when we knew that she had the diagnosis, which wasn't right away, but when we knew that, I said, we need to talk about how you want your life to be and how you want your death to be, you know, because that's in your control to some degree. And the part of it that is in your control, I don't want you to squander that. You know, I want you to really be conscious about how you want that to be handled and how you would like to die. And so we talked about our fears around death and dying literally every day. We would Mm -hmm. drive through the mountains in Malibu and she would cry and say, why is this happening to me? And, you know, she would be distraught and we would talk it through until, you know, she got to a place where she felt more calm and felt like her mind was more open to, to possibility. And You know, we just, I think communication was the key to really talking about what we were scared of. I mean, I was deathly afraid of losing her. Mm. When When I had to leave my job, you know, I was used to making a good amount of money and having, you know, things and vacations and options and dinners out all the time. And all of that came to a screeching all. You know, I mean, she had tests, you know, one, um, genetic test was like $50,000. So we were bleeding money for years and years trying to figure out what was wrong with her. And by the time I stopped working, we were, you know, by doing that was necessarily recognizing that we were choosing to be paupers. (laughs) Instead of working 60 hours a week and, you know, maintaining our lifestyle and also paying for someone to take care of her, I chose poverty and love and i would do that again a thousand times over Mm. it was the right decision and you know if you choose to become poor fear of financial insecurity is gone because (laughs) (laughs) that's you know that's just i always approach things as there is a way through this you know Mm. if you walk around it forever that's what you're stuck doing walking around a problem And if you try to find a way through, eventually you will. And that's what we did. And, you know, Robin was able to live a life that was very full. Mm. When we traveled 11,000 miles in a van, she had a trach and a feeding tube and a catheter. So, I mean, you know, we're living in an unoutfitted cargo van, but we saw everything the country has to offer, you know, and it was beautiful. She... You know, she woke up scared that there were going to be bears, which, to be honest, she had that fear all the time. We were in the desert the first night, and she said, "Are there? Is there such a thing as desert bears?" I was like, "No." What are you about? You know? But um, you know, she had a lot of very childlike fears like that, mm. and so they were a little bit easier to dissipate for me. You know, I could be logical with her, but for her, they were very emotional. They were very strong and really attached to her chest. And so it, it took a while for her to get used to obviously the idea of dying, but um, the idea of having any control over your death, you know, and 
you know, ultimately she was able to die exactly as she wanted to at home in my arms, in our bed, very, very gently. And uh, I think that that happened because she was able to, to consider it for so long that she had made room for death in her life in a way that a lot of people don't. I have never seen anyone uh, be as open with a person who's dying as you were with Robin. Uh, and there were times when it could, it, it could make a person squirm uh, how honest you were and how direct you were with it. It was always in- it a lot of people squirm. <laughs> it was always in the room. I've been in a lot of, by a lot of deathbeds. I've spent, I've done a lot of, I worked in hospice. I have never seen anyone be so transparent about it. And I wonder, did Robin ever push back against that? Did, was she ever, did she ever want you to dial it back? Or, well, or this is her, where a, her whole, a tiny little dose of denial or a tiny little dose of fantasy or what if? No. This is where a whole other element of our relationship comes in, which is that, you know, we had we had a relationship that was sort of based on an extreme order of trust between us. And that was from having had a really fractured relationship for a long time. I mean, Robin was incredibly difficult. You know, she was the traumatized child who becomes, who sees herself as a sexual commodity. And that, is so became so ingrained in her at a young age that it was hard to overcome as an adult seeking sexual gratification. And it created obviously a lot of problems in our relationship. Um, and, you know, I was not on my best behavior when she was behaving badly. It was like a bad ball of badness. And so, you know, over time, what happened was in order to move forward together, after all of these fractures, we had to figure out how to really deeply trust one another outside of the bedroom, you know, really trust one another. And that is exactly what we did. And so Robin would bring her fears to me and she would believe me when I answered her. And so that, I think that dynamic, it's sort of the two headed monster again, is how we approached everything. She could lean on me when she had fear. And I certainly leaned on her. I mean, just yesterday I was talking to her while driving in the car. Obviously she wasn't there. And I was saying, I have nobody to complain to, you know, because I frequently would be sort of complainy, you know, ah, I don't feel good. I'd have like some stupid complaint for five minutes, which, you know, she was always able to assuage. So we had a very strong dynamic between us, which, you know, was very connected to our queerness, our sexuality, which is about trust, essentially. Mm -hmm. So, And so she was able in her condition to tolerate your fears as well. There was space oh, yeah. for your, there was space for your, your moments of panic. You know, as her fear about dying and also fear about not being able to fix some relationships that were very messed up in her life, really just problematic. As those fears went away from her, her heart just grew. And she became able to handle really anything with an incredible amount of grace and love. She was at the end of her life, the most patient, loving, giving sort of human I've ever known. And that is not who she always was. Mm -mm. You know, she was certainly not patient. That is not a word I would ever have used to describe her. But she was at the end of her life for like the last year or so. And it was, you know, it was really a revelation to me about, you know, about what I paint about the human condition, you know, what what people are capable of, how they communicate, you know, what is their relationship to the world around them? She taught me a lot of that, a lot of things I'd been trying to sort out in my paintings for a long time. The big thing she taught me about though was home. You know, the two of us really answered that question. We both separately 
um, you know, from one another for a long, long time had had a major problem with home. Where was home? What did it mean? How did other people get it? You know, how is it going to play a role in our lives? And we answered that with one another, you know, mm -hmm. answer being, you know, that there is not always a place that's a home that works in an ongoing way, but that you find a way of living within the idea of home. Mm -hmm. You sort of bring it with you. And um, that's, that's what I'm going to be writing about as I travel. I want to drill down a little bit more into this, what something important that you said about going to the worst case scenario mm -hmm. and how that inoculates the mind against fear. Sure. How does that work? It's so counterintuitive. It's exactly the yeah. opposite of what people are inclined to do. Uh, so well, how is it, why do you suppose going to the worst scenario helps you relax? You know, it's not unlike a vaccine. You know, it's sort of against logic that inoculate, you know, that injecting you with a little bit of the thing you're trying to avoid will help you avoid it. But it's that exact dynamic. I mean, I think that a lot of times what we as humans are scared of begins to become unearthly in our heads. It's not logic-based ever, fear, ever. It's an overwhelming unknown that we emotionalize, you know, that we swallow. And I think that if you actually take a moment to think about who you are, where you are, and consider those options that seem unthinkable, that the more you realize how, not just how powerful or strong you are, but how much you work in accordance with the world, how much you're part of a bigger thing, at least mm -hmm. that's how I see it, that the more that you become a functionary within the world, in your head, you realize you're not alone. You know, worst case scenario, this happens, I would do this. You envision it, it's like a walkway, you know? And then it's not unknown, it's not overwhelming. Yeah. It's possible, it's scary, but yeah. it's not overwhelming fear, you know? Overwhelming fear is always about, you know, not thinking with your heart, you know? It's about being all caught up in your head and not really thinking with your heart. I think mm -hmm. if you think, through your heart, you see what's possible. You know, what you've already lived through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, and go ahead. She, that's how she approached it for sure. You know? How, how, how? As... Well, I would say to her, she would say, like for instance, when she had to have a tracheostomy, she would have died within weeks if she had not had that trach put in because her vocal cords were closing, they were freezing. And, um, so when we decided to do that, um, I said to her, you know, often people with trachs end up aspirating and getting pneumonia and dying because it's an open space where food can move in both directions. So it's recommended that you do a feeding tube at the same time. And I said to her, you know, anesthesia is very, very dangerous for you. People die from anesthesia when they have these diseases. They go back you know, they, their disease will progress forward years. So I don't want you to have two bouts of anesthesia. I think you should do it all at once, you know, get the feeding tube and the trach. And she was really scared of that, scared of anesthesia, scared of a longer term um, procedure, you know, it would take a much longer amount of time. And so what we did was we walked through the scenarios, you know, and a big one of them was, what if she dies? What if you die? What would you feel you hadn't done or said that you want to do or say? How would you prepare to die if you were going to die? You know? And so, whereas we'd been talking about that for years every day, it gave us a whole new level of talking about that because it felt very immediate as a possibility. Mm -hmm. So that helped her. And then we backed off of that. Well, what if it progresses your disease a lot. You know, how would you function? And we talked about that. 
And we just got back to the, to where we are, you know? And then when she had to go do it, you know, I, I did call her rabbi who she hadn't talked to in like five years. And he talked to her right before they took her in. And I think that helped not Robin didn't believe in God at all, but she believed in that rabbi. So (laughs) she really liked him and she liked his ideas about life. And so she talked to him for a while and she talked to me and some of her friends and she was able to go in with a really open heart. And I think in some ways, you know, we don't know so much about how our brains work and how our bodies work. I think that might've helped her come through that surgery because she had released something that was full of tension in her. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. one practical example of how we did that. I mean, we cried a lot. Robin screamed a lot. Sometimes I would, if I was upset, I could usually hold on to it until there was a moment where I could be upset. But so I, I always leave my keys in the house. Like I'll leave my keys or my phone, you know, I'll come back every five seconds to get something I've left. So I used that uh, habit as a way of getting rid of anger. So when I would put Robin in our car right outside the apartment, and then I'd be like, oh, I forgot my phone. And I'd run back in the apartment, scream at the top of my lungs, and then I'd (laughs) go back out to the car. You know, so, I mean, you have to be creative. But uh, (laughs) yeah, I mean, we... We just also really tried to recognize the beauty around us all the time Mm -hmm. in people, in nature, in possibilities and and weird, you know, occurrences, Mm -hmm. confluences of things unexpectedly, Mm -hmm. you know, driving helped. I mean, we always saw different things. We would drive the same roads all the time through Malibu and every day we would see something different. And I think it made Robin realize that you know anything is possible. I mean, she would talk on and on. You you know her. She didn't like to drive five miles down the road by herself. She wanted me to be driving. She wanted to be in the passenger seat looking out the window. That's what she wanted. So she was scared. Her biggest fear about dying was that she would be alone in an unfamiliar place. It didn't mm-hmm. matter if it was the town next door. She wouldn't want to be in Simi Valley alone. She didn't want to be in death alone. That's the way it went. And so (laughs) she, um, and she also did not want to be without me and her kids. And so she would be scared that she'd be alone in an unfamiliar place, unable to reach the people she loved. Mm -hmm. And so we would just talk about that. And, you know, we talked a lot to her palliative care doctor that helped a lot. You know, we talked about how it just doesn't seem like there would be longing in whatever place your soul goes, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Longing just doesn't seem to be part of that equation, you know? Mm-hmm. So we would talk about that. And we would talk about how resilient she was, how strong she was, and how even if she was in a place alone, she would she would be fine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... So I'm curious about emotional uh, intimacy and the fears that go along with that. Being in relationship can be scary in the best of times. When you're with someone who is confronting something like Robin was confronting, and then to see her be betrayed, for example, which she was by people she loved uh, toward the end of her life, and the rage and the the feelings of protectiveness uh, that must come up for you, um, that's that seems like a very scary place to be. Yeah, a very powerless place to be. That was incredibly difficult and unexpected. Well, some of it was expected, but some of it was unexpected. It was really, really hard for me. Robin was very sad about it consistently, but extremely sad for a while. And then she she just made peace with it. I don't know how it was very much against the nature of the person I had known for so long, but she somehow, you know, sewed it into her being in a way that just allowed it to exist alongside her. And Mm -hmm. I mean, she knew after a while she was never going to see her kids again. Mm -hmm. And then she knew that she probably was never going to speak to them again. A couple of months before she died, she knew that. 
And we talked about it a lot. I was really, really, really sad about it. I wasn't angry about it, but I was incredibly sad about it mm. all the time and a little panicked about it. Um, and the way I dealt with it is I, I just talked to her. I let myself cry. I let myself wonder, you know, what had happened that had caused that situation, the rift that I just didn't understand. I ran over a million possibilities and ultimately it came, you know, to the point where I had to acknowledge that there really was nothing that I could do about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew for sure that in the last seven or eight years of her life, I had done every single thing that I could as, as well as I could. Mm -hmm. Even on my worst day where I failed, I had done the best I could do. I knew that without a doubt. And um, because of that, I had to sort of learn how to try to incorporate it into my life and not question too much. Right. But it's hard. It remains hard. That's probably the hardest thing in my life at this moment mm -hmm. is grappling with that. It's mm -hmm. not having no money and driving off in a van for two years. <laughs> it's worrying about what happened to her, you know, relationships with her kids. So anyway. Right. right. So let me just ask you about mortality for you as a deeper question now. Has, how has this affected your feelings about, uh, about your own? Well, that's uh, a really interesting question. Your own impermanence. I mean... I don't know the answer to that, Mark. I feel like it's opened my eyes to the fact that death walks right beside us every single day. I mean, many, many years ago, the doctor said to me, probably five years ago, it was the first time the doctor said, Robin could die at any minute. You need to have everything in order. It was right when we moved to California. And he was very serious about it. And he was an MSA doctor. He was, you know, her rare disease was his thing. And he said, you need to be prepared. She could have a heart attack at any minute. You know, that's what this disease does. She could fall and hit her head at any minute. And so, you know, I started thinking about death in a physical way almost as being just right beside us all the time then. And I think that that has grown that idea since mm -hmm. Robin became more ill and then died. And, you know, the fact is it just, it make I love life. I love living, you know, I'm not a person who, you know, relaxes easily into letting go of this world. I grasp all day long at this world and try not to, but you know, I, part of it is the visual stimulus of it. I just love the visual of living, you know, things growing and moving around. I just love it. And the thought of not doing that is really, really hard for me. I think of it, I, I try not to think of it as a void, but that's my inclination, is to think of it as a void. And so since Robin died, it changed some of that. I feel Robin strangely in a way I never would have expected. You know, people are always saying, has she visited you? Like, is she a bird or something? No, she, it's almost like she's in my throat. Mm. I feel her inside my brain and my body. Mm. It is the strangest sensation. Mm. And so her dying has made me consider the possibility that we may exist as a soul or the shadow of a soul in some way that I can't envision mm -hmm. that is completely out of my mental repertoire. And so that has been weirdly comforting mm -hmm. because it's about possibility. You know, it's about mm -hmm. not confining myself to one way of thinking about death or this way of thinking about death, but that everything is possible. So I try to look at it that way. It's a challenge. It's hard, you know? Yeah, yeah. In yeah, part yeah. because I feel responsible for living for both of us, you know? <laughs> that's, that's a story that is going to take some unpacking. <laughs> <laughs> that can cut both ways. <laughs> that is totally true. That is totally true. Anyway, Rob, thank you so much for doing this.
You are, you, are, you really have been heroic. I that had so fun. much admiration and gratitude to you. I'm the and, luckiest and, person in the world, Mark. So, so, so lucky. I would do it again a hundred times. Gosh, amazing, amazing. Well, I love you, I'm glad to I be love, I love you too and, and have a great car trip and thank you for so much for taking the time. All right, I'll be in touch. Be in touch, bye-bye.